I thought I would begin this episode by giving you an update on my 240D. You know, we did make some progress this past week, but not as much as I would have liked. In fact, this whole project is turning into a much bigger one than I had originally intended. As I get more and more into it, I start finding other things that I should either repair, inspect, test, clean up, and so on and on it goes. So what I decided to do was to pull this out of the Kent's Garage episode series because it's taking up too much time and if I began to show you everything that I was doing on this engine and engine compartment it would take up half of every episode. So what I'm going to do here is just give you a brief overview of what I've done this past week and kind of give you a sneak peek and then I'm going to start adding all the details of restoring the engine compartment in this 240D into a separate video. It'll be, be a long video, okay? So I'm going to do that now, but I think you'll be pleased, particularly on how this is looking compared to how it looked when we began. So once again, right here, I'm just gonna show you what this engine compartment looked like a few weeks ago when we started this project. Right off, of course, you're going to notice the lack of rust on the engine block and some of the bolts surrounding it. But I think the biggest change you're going to take note of is the condition of the aluminum. Look at how this aluminum looks compared to when we started. Now, it took a lot of work. If you're interested in learning more about how I go about cleaning this old engine aluminum off the engine and even on the engine, we did not remove this part right here, be sure and check out the on-demand video on my website, which goes over all the chemicals and all the procedures I use to get your old aluminum looking like this. And of course, you can see the repaint on the block, how that really helps to kind of blend in everything. Once again, as I said in one of the earlier videos, you're trying to deal with all the flaws. So you're, when your eye sees this, you're gonna say, wow, look at that. And I'm sure some of you are saying, yes, wow, look at that. When I had the valve cover off, of course I inspected the camshaft. I also checked for timing chain stretch and checked internal engine timing. There's a separate video on that that I posted last night. So if you're interested in knowing the procedures on how I did that, be sure and check that video out. And of course, the valve adjustment. We, we were really impressed. We only had to adjust two of the valves. They were all almost right on. Now let's go over to this side and I'll show you what I've done and what I'm doing. And this will kind of help you understand why this project is going on and on and on. Just yesterday, I finished rebuilding these fuel injectors and I put a special coating on the steel to keep them from rusting. Look at the tips. Would you say the tips in these new Monarch nozzles look a lot better than those old ones I removed a few weeks ago? I'm going to cut away right now and I want to show you this little technique I used for putting this metal protectant on these fuel injectors. I've just finished cleaning and rebuilding the fuel injectors for the 240D and I've thoroughly cleaned these off with brake cleaner. What I want to do before I install these is to apply a coating of my special metal protectant. It's a really nice sealant. You may have seen me use it on some of my other videos, but I'm going to put a coat on this because I don't want these rusting. This is very common. Once you clean these up, you can't really paint them, but I do want to keep them looking nice. So I'm going to put a coat of this sealer. It goes on like a real thin varnish. And it almost dries like a varnish, but it does have some high temp resistance capabilities. And I'm not going to worry about the threads. I'll get a little bit here on the nipples and in behind the nipples. You can see it doesn't take very much. One dip into, I, I use a small container like that, and just one dab in there will do this entire fuel injector. And you do have to be careful you don't get it on too thick because it will run. So I'll just go around it here a little bit to make sure it's not going to run. Let a little bit seep down in here under the threads. And then you can see I've used this box. I just cut some slots in here. So these will stay upright while they dry. So I'll go ahead and do these other three now and then let them dry for about an hour and they'll be ready to install in the engine. Now I'm just setting these in place. I'm not going to tighten them down yet because I'm still doing some work. I went ahead and installed the fast glow plugs and put the new wiring in. But if you look right here, look at this little cup. Anybody want to guess what I'm trying to do here? That's right, injection pump timing. Let me show you this close up and you can kind of see what I'm doing. I'm going to explain a little bit about the challenge of doing injection pump timing. Here you can see I've set up the drip tube and I've got this little 
container to catch the drips. But I know a lot of diesel owners have been very frustrated trying to set their injection pump timing using the drip tube because if you follow the instructions in the Hayes manual or even in the factory manual, it's a little confusing and a little unclear and a lot of owners report never being able to get it to drip like it's supposed to or what it says in these manuals. So I have set about on a new challenge today. We're not gonna complete this probably for another week. I wanna come up with the instructions and the detailed method that will allow owners to set their own injection pump timing without all the frustrations that have been reported in a lot of these forms. So this is gonna be my new challenge for the week. How do I give people the information they need and the products they need and the kit or instructions or whatever it's gonna take so that you can use this drip tube and you can do the timing and know it's right when you're done. Because a lot of people are saying, I don't know, it, I thought it was dripping one drip a second, or maybe it wasn't dripping, or it kind of dripped, but I, I just called it good, okay? I hear, I hear this over and over again. So that's my challenge this week, using this 240D to figure out how I can deliver the instructions to people to help them get their injection pump timing checked and adjusted properly. In this episode, I'm gonna introduce you to a new segment. We're gonna call this Kent's favorite product of the week. This will kind of go along with my favorite tool of the week. But this one particularly shined, later on you get the pun, this week when working on my 240D. If you recall, a couple of episodes ago, I showed you this fan trap and how dirty and filthy it was. Well, guess what I cleaned it up with? Wax, that's right. Well, it's not your normal wax, but I bet a lot of you have never thought of using a wax on hard plastic. But this product, Acrylic Works, is so amazing that, <laughs> you know, I actually sell on my website, so I guess this is a commercial, okay? You can call this Kent's commercial of the week. But I really am enthusiastic about this product. We took and cleaned this shroud and then using this sponge with a microfiber, what's really exciting about acrylic works is when you get it and polish a car it doesn't leave that white streaks on the rubber or the plastic it doesn't leave that powdery look that a lot of other waxes do and boy it will really make the car shine if some of you wondered how i got happier to shine <laughs> as well as i did well there's the product right there okay but all you have to do is clean this up and then get in and buff this with this acrylic works and not only does it leave a natural sheen to the plastic, it also protects it. It's like a sealant. So it isn't going to get as dirty or as filthy as quickly as it did before. And then you can just take some blue shop towels. I usually use these to just buff it off. And there you have it. You know, there's some scratches and scuffs on this, but you'll have to admit this almost looks like a new fan shroud in a car that's 40 years old. Now I'm going to take you over to the car and show you some trim around the doors that can be real tough to get looking like new again. And once again, Acrylic Works comes to the rescue. This really hard plastic trim on these older models like the W114, W115, W123 can get looking very grungy. It gets very faded. Look what I've done to this. This has been polished with the Acrylic Works. I didn't have to buff it too much. Of course, I cleaned it a little bit with a cleaner and then came in and really started rubbing with the acrylic works to got this nice sheen. Now I've tried all kinds of products. I've tried back to black. I've tried things with silicone in them. Most of them will look pretty good for a few weeks, but after a while, they'll start looking kind of bad again. I'm gonna show you up top what I mean. I know it's hard to show this on camera, but I think I got a really good shot of what I'm talking about here. See all the fading and discoloration? That's what you're gonna see on most of these older Mercedes Benzes. Now I can restore this using acrylic works, but before I apply the acrylic works, I wanna use a cleaner and what I'm using here is Purple Power. I wanna take as much of the grime and crud off of here that you can with a good cleaner before applying the acrylic works. See, you can see how much I'm getting off. It's not too bad. Once I clean this hard plastic thoroughly, I'm going to apply the acrylic works. You don't need a lot of it. I like using these sponges with a microfiber cloth on them. 
I'm just going to wipe that down and then rub it in. What I like about this product, it doesn't leave a superficial shiny film on the hard plastic. It actually leaves a dull sheen that looks pretty factory from when the car was new. You put two coats on, usually what I'll do is I'll let this dry off for 15, 20 minutes and then come in and lightly buff it, but this will last compared to other products that don't last that long. Like you saw on that back edge, I had done that probably about a month ago and it's still looking good today. So that's my favorite product of the week, folks. I just love Acrylic Works. My 1994 E320 Coupe is in the shop as promised and I'm going to begin the 2000 hour inspection today. And I'm going to start with shock absorbers. I'm sure some of you are saying, well, why do you start with shocks? Well, let me explain. A couple episodes ago, I mentioned that I thought the shocks were bad. And I actually went through some tests. Now, shocks are an interesting subject. But before I get into that, I want to explain why I'm going to do the shocks. I know they're bad. And it'll give me an opportunity to get under the car, take every single wheel off, and at that point, I can inspect bearings, brakes, suspension parts, bushings, and so on. So this is going to give me a really good opportunity to complete a chassis 2,000 hour inspection by replacing these shocks that I know need to be replaced anyway. Now let's go back to what I said earlier about shocks being a big subject. You know, there's all kinds of opinions out there. I can't believe it. Some people will say, oh, you don't ever have to replace shocks. They'll go for 200,000 miles. Other people say, well, I had these on my old Mercedes at 220,000 miles, my shocks were still good. Well, how does he know they're good? <laughs> I mean, maybe they're still functioning, but are they functioning at 100%? In fact, when I purchased this white coupe from the original, and it wasn't the original owner, it was a second owner who had owned it since 1998. So that's, what, 16, 17 years this person had driven this car? And when I was test driving it, I told them the shocks were bad. And the owner looked at me and said, what? No, I don't think so. I just drove this car up to... Northern British Columbian back and it drove beautifully. So that's a great example of a point I want to make here. When you own the car and you drive it consistently every day for years, the decline of your shock absorbers is gradual, particularly with Bilsteins. They're gas over hydraulic and you may start to lose some of the gas ump, but some of the hydraulics will still work. So sometimes the bounce test may not even work, but look at the bounce test on the front of this one. I mean, and it's squeaking too, see that? So it's really bouncing up and down. And the other day outside, I did a bounce test on the back end. Well, that's not always the best way to tell, but I think mileage is a pretty good indication, but not always because it has to do also with how you drive or where you drive. If you're driving over rough roads all the time, of course the shocks aren't going to last as long as if all you're driving is on a nice smooth freeway. So there are some variables, but I'm going to say this. When the car reaches 100,000 miles and the shocks have not been changed, I recommend you change them. Because why do we drive these Mercedes Benzes? We drive them because of the handling, the ride, the feel, the road feel, if I could say that. And if gradually declines over time, well, sure they're gonna cost a few hundred dollars to replace the shocks, but if you do it yourself, you're only out the cost of the shock. And it will give you an opportunity to get into the car and take a look. You know, why is that squeaking when I push up and down? I need to find that out, right? So don't neglect shock absorbers. I think shock absorbers are probably one of the most neglected maintenance and safety items. Now, people will think, what do you mean safety? Well, if you have a Mercedes that's swaying all over the place, imagine what might happen in a panic, heavy braking swerve situation. You lose control of the car because of the shocks. Also, if you get heavy braking, let's say you're going 70 miles an hour and there's a pile up, up ahead of you, you have heavy braking with bad shocks, you get a lot of nose dive. And that transfers no braking to the back tires. And that could be the difference between you hitting or not hitting the person in front of you. So it is a safety issue. It also is a riding comfort and handling issue. So I'm 
pretty hyped on people changing their shock absorbers because you can't imagine how many cars I've seen over the years. I would say 80% of them that are older than 15 years old, they need new shock absorbers. Even though the owner may say, well, I think the shocks are fine. <laughs> because once again, they've been living with them over a long period of time where they don't notice that gradual decline in ride and handling. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do the shock on the shop floor because I know a lot of you don't have a lift. So I thought it'd be a good opportunity to demonstrate how to replace shocks like you would have to do in your own garage. So we're gonna be working on the shock absorbers this week, inspecting some of the other chassis key points, and I'll come back next week and give you a report of what we find. Now replacing the shocks or the strut in a W124 is not difficult. For those of you who have only replaced the shocks in the 123 or the 126, you might look at this and say, wow, that looks kind of complicated, but it's not. And I think you'll find that in the video next week that you'll see how simple it is to replace these. I have also purchased new rubber top mounts for the struts or the shocks, whichever you want to call them. Because if I push down on this and put my hand right on the rubber here, I can feel a little bit of movement. Now you may say, oh, the rubber looks good. I don't see any cracks. That's kind of like looking at motor mounts and saying, oh, they look good. Looking is not enough when it comes to rubber parts. So if you really want to restore that ride and handling like you could experience in a brand new W124, I highly recommend you change these top rubber mounts at the same time you change the front shocks or struts, okay? Now the rears are very similar to what you've seen on the older cars but we'll get the car jacked up. What we're going to do, by the way, is we're gonna change just the left side, the front and the rear on the left, and then I'm gonna take this back out on the road and see if I can demonstrate the difference. I've never done this before, so it'll be kind of an experiment, but it might be kind of fun because I wanna see if I can demonstrate filming inside the car the difference between the left side and the right side between good shocks and bad shocks. So stay tuned for next week. Let's find out if that works, okay? And now for the questions of the week. This first one I want to share with you is really an opinion, okay? But I get this question so often that I want to share it with the viewers. And that's, Kent, what oil do you recommend for your older Mercedes-Benz? You can't imagine how many times I get emails, people asking this question. I tend to avoid giving my own opinions a lot on my website because once again, there's a preference involved. I don't have any scientific data that says this oil is better than that oil. I haven't taken engines apart at 500,000 miles with one running one brand and another one running another brand and then getting my micrometers out and checking for where. So this is going to be my favorite or my recommendation and that's for diesels only. Now I, I want to throw this out there. I'm considering doing a whole video on, on oil talking about different oils for different types of gas engines, both older and newer, with mileage considerations, with smoking considerations. But in this particular episode, I'm just going to address diesel oil on the older diesels. These are the diesels in the 90s and older, you know, that have not been running synthetic oil. And I recommend Chevron Dello 1540. Now I found that a lot of diesels will use a little oil because they're really old now. So they get up there in mileage. You know, very seldom do you see an old Mercedes diesel in the 90s and older that's only got 100 or 150,000 miles on a most or two, three, 400,000 miles. And as they begin to use oil, that also means the oil tends to get contaminated faster because you have blow-by going by the rings and you have diesel fuel and exhaust fumes and so on contaminating the oil. So it's not so much the oil as the interval of changing. I recommend you always change your oil every 3,000 miles in these older diesels. And if it is using oil or leaking oil, I recommend that you add a can of Luber Molly Motor Oil Saver. This will help reduce oil consumption and it will help reduce smoke. And if you have some bad oil leaks, it will slow them down a little bit. It's not going to stop oil leaks. That's not the purpose of the oil saver. It really is a viscosity enhancer. In other words, it thickens the oil up a little bit. It puts some additives uh, into the oil. And I found that this particular brand right here, Lubramoly, is a good one for these old diesels. So let me know if you'd like to see 
an expanded video. It won't be in the Kent's Garage episodes, but I'll just do a separate video on YouTube going over my recommendations for all the different types of oil, both in the old and in the new Mercedes-Benz, okay? Number two, this question goes, hello, Kent, I have an 83 300 CD, and I guess it is not running as it should. It is very sluggish between 20 miles per hour and 35 to 40 miles per hour while in low RPMs. Once it gains a little more RPMs, it's getting better and better. Should I suspect the turbo or make a diesel perch? All fuel filters are two years old and I've never done a perch. I've cleaned all the banjo bolts and still nothing. Please give me some direction where to look for. Okay, that question is probably the number one question that I have received over the past 20 years has to do with diesel engines not performing properly. Now, about 12 years ago, I wrote a book. This was my second book, and it's called Diesel Performance Tuning and Repair, and it's primarily for the older diesels, 1985 and older. It goes through all the different issues that you might run across if you own one of these old diesels and are trying to get it running better, performing better, with better fuel economy. And this manual is really written for the beginning DIY mechanic, okay? But I highly recommend that you get this because what I can say is it's gonna be more than one thing. I can guarantee it due to the age. It could be problems with the timing chain. And by the way, I've done a timing chain, chain stretch video that I just posted last night. I'll put a link here in the show more of this video. And I want you to look at that video because you need to go and, and Consider examining your engine for physical health before you do anything else. A lot of people start throwing money, they'll rebuild their injectors or they'll put this on or they've even been told they need a new injection pump and they spend hundreds of dollars only to find out their engine has weak compression and there's nothing you can do to improve that, okay? The engine is worn out. You need to determine that right up front, particularly when you buy one of these older diesels. So I'm gonna recommend that you watch that video that I put up last night and then go to my website. I've got some links there for some kits that we have. We have a physical exam kit, which includes a compression tester, the wrenches to adjust your valves, because you always need to adjust the valves. Before you do a compression test, you need to do the compression test to make sure the engine is healthy, have good, strong compression, and otherwise your diesel is not gonna run very well. It's not gonna produce good power. It's gonna have poor fuel economy. And you wanna make sure the chain is not stretched because when the chain is stretched, that affects performance, that affects the injection pump timing. And I'm working on this injection pump timing video that I wanna be doing here in the next couple of weeks. So there's a lot of factors. Once you determine that you have a good, solid, strong engine internally, then you can start looking at fuel injectors, injection pump timing, and other issues that I cover in my manual. So I hope you find that helpful. I know there's no simple answer. I can't tell you to go out and just rebuild your injectors or do a diesel purge. A diesel purge may help a little bit, but it's probably not going to solve the root issue if the engine has quite a few miles on it and it hasn't had a lot of preventative maintenance done on it over the last, say, let's five years or so. So I hope that helps. I hope you find some solutions to get your old diesel running better. Now, question three, this is a good one. How is it going with the LED light kit? I want to order one of these light kits for my 240D just as soon as you're done with it. <laughs> oh boy, guess what? I took off last week, got all excited. I brought in all these LED lights, all kinds of lights. We have probably three or $400. This is only part of them, but I ordered big ones, little ones, multi LEDs, single strobe LEDs. And the more I got into it, the more research I did, I began to think, uh oh, we got a problem. Anybody want to guess what that problem is? <laughs> Come on, guess. Guess what the problem is, which will affect whether or not I do a kit and sell it on my website. Yeah, the problem is legality. I'm finding out a lot of these LED lights that are sold on eBay or Amazon probably aren't even legal in most of the states. If you do your own research in your own state where you drive, you'll find out that the government has a lot of requirements, very strict requirements on the lights, on the reflective capacity of the light, the intensity of the light, when it comes to brake lights, tail lights, 
turn signal lights. So I'm sorry to say, folks, that I'm going to be hands off on this one. I actually learned a few things. Now, I won't share it in this episode, but I'm going to share it in next week's episode. I'm just going to give you a few things I learned because you're pretty much going to be on your own if you decide to go LED lights. I am going to, by the way, come up with some LED lights for the trunk light and the dome light. I found some really good warm white ones. I do not particularly like cool white for inside the cabin or inside the trunk. I like a more warm white that really lights up the trunk. And the other area may be backup lights because that's really not a legal issue like it is on the other lights. So I'm sorry to report, it doesn't look like I'm gonna be able to come up with the kit that I had hoped <laughs> to come up with because of the reasons I just mentioned. Okay, so we'll set these LED lights back. I don't know, I hope the seller will take these back because I've got a lot of LED lights laying around here. Okay, number four. You mentioned worn out shocks in your last episode. How many miles can you expect out of Bilstein shocks? Okay, thank you for that question. I just answered it previously in this video. I do want to add a couple things. I didn't mention that the white coupe that you saw has 115,000 miles. Okay, 115. So that in my book is prime for new shocks because there's no record that the shocks were ever replaced. The owner actually gave me quite a stack of maintenance records. And once again, even going into these shops that do brake work and other work, I find that the shocks are kind of left. They're kind of like, well, you know, unless the owner asks for them, I'm, you know, I'm not going to tell them. A lot of times owners think, oh, you're just trying to make money by telling me I need new shocks. But the, the other thing I'm learning, particularly with these older cars, it's not so much the mileage or the, even the driving. This car was driven on the freeway, garaged all the time, but we're talking rubber and we're talking age, we're talking seals, we're talking fluids and we're talking over 20 years old. So this is another example that shocks can also suffer from just sitting, okay? It's not so much how rough the roads are. So it'll be kind of interesting. When I get the shocks off the E320 here, we'll compare them side by side with the new shocks and we'll go through some testing. And once again, we're gonna do some road testing to see if we can see a comparison between the right and left side when I get it out on the road in the next couple of days. Next question. This came from a viewer, he said, Ken, a couple of videos you mentioned road feel. Uh, what do you mean by road feel? You're probably the only person that can answer that. And I had to chuckle because I do use that quite a bit. I don't even know if other people use it. But I guess it comes from my flying background where when you're flying an airplane, a lot of the way you control that airplane is by feel, okay? It's right down here. <laughs> you feel it. When you're coming into approach to land on a real short airstrip, you can feel the sink rate you can feel the airplane approaching a stall. So I guess you call that air feel, okay? <laughs> but when I started driving Mercedes-Benz, I said, man, I love the feel of these cars. So that's when I kind of coined the phrase, these cars have great road feel. What's interesting is they have the ability not to feel the road, while at the same time, they have the ability to really feel the road. Now, I know some of you are saying, Kent, well, where are you going with that one? All right, compare riding in a Mercedes with let's say a Honda, Toyota, or some other import. Those cars, you can feel the road. You can feel every bump. You can hear the road noise. Okay, so the, that is the road feel that's a negative feel because you're hearing, feeling everything through the road. And when you ride in a Mercedes, a lot of that disappears. A lot of that harsh road noise a lot of that vibration that you'll feel because of the rough ride and the, and the lack of rubber in the suspension. And by the way, that's why these Mercedes ride and handle so well. There's a lot of rubber parts in there. And of course, they have to be replaced after 15 to 20 years. So that's the negative side of feel. Now the positive side of feel, I feel when I'm driving a Mercedes Benz that I have total control, particularly if it has a good tight suspension and new shock absorbers and good brakes. It's amazing how much I feel in control of that car. It's like getting in an airplane and taking off. If you're a pilot and you've flown a number of different airplanes, it only takes you a few minutes in a new airplane to get a feel for it. And you say, well, this thing, you know, handles like a truck and maybe there's a lot of heavy control movement on the yoke, the control wheel, and you can just right away, all those senses come in and you start saying, man, I don't like the feel of this airplane. And that's pretty much the same with me and cars. I get in the car and I go two blocks. 
and I go, wow, I love the road feel. You see what I'm saying? It's the feel. It's the feedback coming from the road and feeling like I'm in total control when I steer, brake, accelerate. All that is feeding back into my senses and I feel real good, okay? So that's my definite of road feel. I know it may sound a little confusing, but once again, I drive Mercedes because I really love the way they feel driving down the road. Okay, that wraps up this episode. We're going to be working on the shocks on the E320. We're gonna be bringing in another car, by the way. In fact, you're going to get to be introduced to the newest member of my fleet. And this one is a real sweetheart. And it isn't a toy car this time, okay? This is a serious collector car. And I'm gonna be proud to show you this car next week because you're gonna go, wow, Kent, where in the world did you find that one?